Before we look at some of the keywords in reflective practice, we would like to introduce you to our CPUT student participants who will be using reflection to learn from their own practical experiences in the classroom under the guidance of their lecturers. The lecturers are Anapola Lombard, Foundation Phase Mathematics Education Lecturer, Trevor Moodley, Foundation Phase Mathematics Education Lecturer, and Nikki Rousseau, Foundation Phase Senior Lecturer. The B. Et Foundation Phase fourth year students are Vidat Williams, Tatum Thomas, Lazelle Kipidu, and Tracy Heath. The purpose of this video is twofold. Firstly, to reflect on certain pedagogical issues which arose from the mathematics teaching of the student participants in grade R and 1. Secondly, to explore the use of reflection as a means of integrating theory and practice. But first a clarification of some of the key concepts dealt with in this video. Theoretically, the reflective practice was based on the following key concepts. Pedagogy involves two aspects of learning. The first is associated with what and how students are learning. The second is about the teacher as learner, learning about teaching and building expertise. At the heart of all practice lies noticing an opportunity to act appropriately. This requires three things. Being present and sensitive to the moment, having reason to act, and having a different act come to mind. A critical incident is an incident which contributes significantly either positively or negatively to your learning as a student of teaching. Reflection is the mental process of trying to structure or restructure, also called frame or reframe, an experience, a problem or existing knowledge or insights. You will now return to the menu page where you will be able to select, watch and reflect on a critical incident. Tracy Heath is modeling the learner's strategies for solving a subtraction problem. I have a friend, her name is Jane, and Jane loves apples. She has five apples, five apples. And she takes them home, and her brother, Thomas, decides to eat two of her apples. He eats two of her apples. So we're going to draw our five apples. These are Jane's five apples. How many more must I draw to make five? Two. Two. Good. So she has five apples. Yes, well done. We're going to put a five underneath. And then her brother, Thomas, comes along and he eats two of her apples. Two of her apples. Who can tell me what is happening in our story? What is our story about? Who can help me? Tim, do you want to help me? What is our story about? What's happening in our story? Right. And she had three left. And how did you know that she had three left? How did you, how did you start to work that out? <coughs> right, 
Who's going to help him? Who's going to help him? We're going to ask, let's ask, let's ask Daniel. So how do we know? How do we know? Tim's right. He says we have three apples left. Right, but how do we know we have three apples left? How do we know? Do you, do you, do you know, Daniel? All right, come on, tell us. Um, because he had two of the apples and the other three left. So, but how many did we have to start with? Tell me how many apples we started with. Five. Five. And then what happened? Um, Thomas came and ate two of them. He came and ate two of them. And then what happened? Um, they're going to have three left. They're only going to have three left. Right. Does anybody else want to say, Nina? Because we counted. We counted. Did we count forwards or did we count backwards? Forwards. Did we? Backwards. backwards. We counted backwards. But sometimes if you knew the answer, then you'd count, add two more, then you'd know it would be five. But to get your answer, Nina said she counted backwards. Right. Well done, grade R's. So this was the introduction part of the lesson because I did do um, a, a, gr a group lesson after this. So this was just the introduction. Mm -hmm. And um, so we were just doing a few different types of problems as a whole class to begin with. And looking at it now, <laughs> the way I represented the second problem, the one which we saw now, was <coughs> so wrong. Because it, if I had seen that as a child, I would have automatically thought I had to add the two numbers together from the way I had drawn it. <laughs> so it looked very confusing. Um, especially with the one above it. I don't know if you guys saw that, which Ooh. was an addition one. Yes. So that was very confusing. What I should have done was drawn the five apples that was right, and that was okay. And then coloured in two, so they could have seen two that were different or taken away. Because that would have been a better representation than what I had drawn, because it looked very confusing. Coloured in two? Any other? I think, I, I saw that she has a number line behind her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the learners were saying, she was asking the learners counting forwards or backwards. Yes. So the, mm -hmm. the, the number line would have been useful to demonstrate the forwards and the backwards. Definitely, with a pig. Mm. Yeah. You need to consider that... Um, some of them need that to, to, to lure them or to simulate their interest, you need to have different forms, not just one. In one, in, in one class alone, there are many um, intelligences. So to consider that, to consider that diversity, I think it's important to have more than one representation of one particular aspect. Yeah. Did she have more than one? What, what representation do you the, see there? Uh, it was the, the drawing. Mm -hmm. Yes. And... Um, and speaking by speaking to them mm -hmm. verbal linguistic aspect yes. so kind of aesthetically she could have involved the learners that could have represented the apples or um, perhaps using the number line or many other aspects but mm. perhaps the beads as well to represent the five apples yeah. and there was also um, another representation you used the numbers mm. yeah. so there was quite an abstract aspect mm. this mm. Let us now look at another critical incident, also with a focus on contextual diversity. Vidat Williams is teaching. So you have your seven counters on the board. The other counters you're packing on the side, okay? Like Zoe over here. Just make bundles, okay? All right, can I start? Aiden, are you ready? Aiden? Right. So, good ones, look at me. Look at me. You've got seven counters, right? But now, you have seven counters, right? And we want to make, good ones, are you looking at me? We want to make ten. So we need something to make ten. Danielle, hold on. So seven plus something. Danielle seems to know the answer, but Danielle and everybody else, will you show me using a different color? So you've got your seven counters. Show me using a different color how many more counters you need to make them. Well done, Seth. Sarah Lee? Four, four, six, seven, right? Now I want you to use a different color. You've got blue as well. Use a different color to show me how you are going to make 10. That's it. Okay. 
sit. So let's read this number sentence together. Seven plus something is equal to ten. Are there any other um, aspects of group teaching that you'd like to talk I, about? I'm actually, the whole time I was noticing how big that group was. Mm -hmm. And that little girl is actually sitting um, off almost against the board. So that is actually a, quite a, a big problem. Um, first of all, the group is big. Mm. So you can't really, the aim of group teaching is to get to the individual mm -hmm. and here we can't now obviously it's a social issue it's the amount of children we have in our classes and 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 Time. and with the requirements mm -hmm. of caps how do we actually then get all the children in and meet the curriculum expectations or requirements and the other thing is I noticed the little boy at the back he he packed his counters mm -hmm. a little different way from others which wasn't a problem but then he was unsure and changed it and then I started wondering, now, because he, he changed it the whole time, was it that he wasn't sure, maybe? And then as without was giving instructions, he, he almost seemed not to be able to follow those instructions. So again, I'm wondering, does he understand what he's supposed to do? Does he know the number concept or the amount that she wants? Is that, I don't know the level of children we're on, but is that maybe uh, maybe her lower group? Or is that the child that's just, just maybe... Intervene, cause, um, I think, and I'm going to explain my reason, I think that it was uh, with the instruction because initially, initially she said to them, pack out seven counters, mm. and he had done that. Mm. And then she said, take you the rest of your counters and put it to the side. So what he had done was he packed all of his counters down to the side. Mm. And that is, you see, that is where that came in. So it was, I don't think it was a problem with number. I think it was instruction because he packed out the right amount of counters, but he... Uh, I think from her instruction, he thought that he should pack up the seven counters on the side. But uh -huh. then when he looked at the other yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and then he started yeah. to pack the counters back. Yeah. You know, so. I think that's also another problem with such a big group, is that the copying and yeah. watching mm. the other children becomes mm. much easier for the mm. children. And, the teacher can't pick up on and then mm. you as a teacher mm. are not aware mm. who actually is doing the work. Who yeah. is the child mm -hmm. that actually mm. has the understanding if they're copying from one another. Mm. Um, but the other thing for me that comes up with group teaching is, um, especially in another teacher's class, yeah. is abilities. Because I think sometimes teachers have preconceived ideas mm. of where a child should be according to their ability, um, possibly from report marks from the previous year or things like that. And I understand in your first few weeks of school, you as a teacher need to mm. figure out where those children yes. need to go, and that is pretty much your only guideline. But I found, for me, in my class, very little changed from the first teaching mm. prac to the second teaching prac, which was interesting for me because I could see a change in the children. Mm. And I could see children who were definitely in the wrong group because mm. they were way too advanced for their group or they had become too weak for the group they were in and they were becoming frustrated because they were not keeping up with the level mm. of the other children. And I think that is a mistake that a lot of us make. We mm. think that we now have our groups, perfect. We have our three groups or our four groups. Right, now we don't have to worry about that for the rest of the year, we sorted. But we actually need to constantly be reflecting on the abilities of the children and realizing are they coping at this level? Are they actually at the understanding with the rest of the group? Is my teaching appropriate for that specific group? And that I think we need to take into consideration. And for me, personally, that is quite difficult. Mm -hmm. Because I, and I did learn one thing from my teacher though about group work is always have um, a grid with each child's name on it um, in, a, in a square and write down things, write what they're doing. Don't leave it until the end of the day to write down the little notes. Make time, find time, because they're things that you forget, like number reversals, for example, mm -hmm. which you think, oh, they're still young, it's okay. And then you realize, oh my goodness, they're still doing this in term four. There might be a problem here. And those small things that you write sh in shorthand mm. and you keep, and they're nice for your report comments too. Um, and that's where you can sort of see, hmm, not really coping with this concept in this group, but maybe just for this concept mm. I can move that child down. Not necessarily sticking to those groups all the time. I like what you're saying because what it reminds me of is this whole constant tension, and I think CAPS has made it worse, between what is and what should be. Mm. You know, you, are you teaching 
in terms of what CAPS is saying, what should be happening yeah. now, where the children should yes. be? In other words, are you teaching curriculum yeah. or are you teaching children? children. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a tension that I think is uh, probably has m a, a much bigger impact on the psychology of, of a teacher today than we probably understand mm. or that we probably think. Mm. Because so many teachers, when you talk to them, they say, this is a constant tension with me. I, th there's this curriculum, do I stick to that? Or, you know, my children. So I like the fact that you're saying that you have something next to you, you make little notes on the different children's abilities, the, where they are at, and that as a teacher, you can constantly then pick up from there when, when the opportunity is. In this following incident, Tatum Thomas is teaching the conservation of number using the arrangement of six. Okay. I'll show you another one. Hamza. Yes, six. Well done. How did you know that it was six? Because there is five on top and one at the bottom, Hamza. Because there's one at the bottom and there's five on the top. And you saw one at the bottom and five on top, Anik? <laughs> you saw three on this side and then three here as well. Okay. Mm. What I saw the um, Tatum was you were using that as a starting point, yeah. mm. and then one could take it further, not necessarily based on what was there, because mm. some children, as you say, wouldn't see a five and then another mm. two. It would be a little confusing. So, mm. but based on the understanding of six, mm. that's when the child was able to come up with, with three, plus three. Just going back to what you said about the different arrangements. Remember what Piaget said about that conservation of number. Which means? <laughs> <laughs> that amount can be represented in different ways. Right. It's the same amount, but the amount doesn't change because the physical appearance is different. Yes. But it's still the same. So a six will always be six, it. even if it's represented as a three and a three, or mm. two, 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 or five and a one. So uh, with young children, probably maybe still in grade R, what's you also explain the limitation in terms of conservation. You know, that they have difficulty with it. Mm -hmm. uh, that they can't look at the situation and be flexible in their thinking. Do you remember what that limitation, what, what he spoke about? Mm. That they just Every center time. maybe on, on one aspect. Yeah. And maybe it's the, if you're looking at arrangements, yeah. they don't look maybe specifically at the number, but look at, at the amount of space. Yes. Mm. yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm thinking of the water example. Mm -hmm. Um, that's always when I think of Piaget and conservation comes into my mind. If you have a long, um, thin, uh, tall, thin bottle with water fairly close to the top and a shorter, much wider bottle with the same amount of water as the other one they're going, they might think that the longer one has more because it looks, the signs, yeah. because of the way it's represented, yeah. Yeah. where it, could, it would still be the same. Yeah. So that example always comes to my mind when I think of conservation, how they, they tend to choose that mm -hmm. aspect of, oh, it looks taller, so it must have more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Centration. Yes, yeah. So you can make the link to conservation with numerosity, mm. with number. Okay. In this incident, we will look at how Lizelle Cupido handles questioning. Where does it go? Next to number one. Now, if we look at that number, is that, is it, what is different from the second card to the first card? Thank you. 
What is different between the two cards? Now, does this have more dots or less dots than that one? More. So to get more, what do we do? Make it bigger. How do we make it bigger? Hold on. Yes, what do we do? How do I make this number bigger? Raise your hand if you want to answer me. Sit down, cross your legs. Yes. A lot of numbers? Yes. Yo, Ayub? Hundred. All right. Ayub, can a hundred fit on our number line? Is there space for a hundred? So we're working with this number. Now, let's see. There's one dot and there's one dot. So what did we do here? Two dots. So did we take away a dot or did we add a dot? Right. Sometimes we find ourselves in a situation where we suggest things. We sometimes feel we become desperate because we're not reaching the learners and, and we're not getting exactly what we plan or the outcome that we wanted from them. Uh, and then we, we find ourselves suggesting, so do you think are we, we are doing this or do you think we are doing that? So we find ourselves doing that. Mm. So mm. Uh, yeah, those are one of the things that I, because I know I do that as well. I make that mistake we as well. Do. So for me, it's a learning curve to see somebody else you know, do it as well. You know, they share some of the experience that I, I do as a teacher, so as to see, you know, what mm. I could have done if I was in a situation. Thank you. Yeah, to prevent me from Is there any parting comments? I don't know, just what I was <laughs> saying, <laughs> waiting, giving them the opportunity. Um, we so quick to rush in. Yes. But some much. children take a little bit longer. For us, it's so easy, one plus one. But <laughs> for them, it might not be. And also, I was now I'm thinking, oh, I could have asked that question. And I was thinking, why didn't I ask the difference? And why didn't I ask two more? Two more is not really such a big stretch. Um, and I'm sure they would have been able to do it. And it might just have um, helped them with, you know, conceptualizing all these numbers and where it goes. And as Dr. Moodley was saying, start it at a different place. And if the teachers value that, if a teacher values the children working out things in different ways, the children, it becomes a completely different classroom dynamic. It becomes a very social, a very interactive class, mm -hmm. which I think a lot of teachers are afraid of because they're afraid the children might bring up something or a method they don't understand because they don't know how to question. But I think we've been very fortunate to have, especially with this project, have been exposed to so many different ways of approaching different methods and how to question and the value of questioning because for me that's what's stood out the most from the last four years is how in from first year to third year I didn't understand the value of questioning I thought mm. you know what we're asking these questions okay right mm. done this one two three four ask all of them let's move on I didn't understand how important the oh, questions are and how they help you reflect on what has happened. Mm. I always felt reflections from first year to, to third year. I was stuck. I didn't know how, I don't want to say I didn't know how to reflect, but I found it difficult to reflect because I hadn't actually asked the children what they were doing or, or found out their understanding, which re affects your reflection because I didn't have any, I, I had very little to comment on what they had learned because I didn't know what they had learned. So for Very me, that, that is what I have gained over the last four years. In fourth year, it all came together for me. It was like a little aha moment that the children have. I had that with questioning and how you can almost in a way never ask too many questions. I was just thinking, you were saying that there are quite a lot of benefits to informal assessment. You can do that with a small group, whereas it might be difficult with a whole class. What other benefits of group teaching would you say you've experienced? Um, I've experienced that, um, that we actually see the children um, sort of improving. You can see it, the, it benefits the teacher and the learner as well because you're able to see okay with a smaller group not as as large as, as a group that I had there you're able to see uh, where the learners are at and you need to know that's what you need to know so you're able to see where they are at because 
because you are working closer with them and they are um, able to t you are able to listen to them and and you're able to f to figure out what they're lacking and and what they need when when working with with smaller groups and mm -hmm. micro teaching For me i think i what i really enjoy about group teaching is the relationship you build with the children mm -hmm. I think with the whole class it's very difficult to build a relationship yeah. with the children where you can truly understand them and they can truly try uh, understand you and you build this relationship of trust where mm. they feel safe to answer in a smaller mm. group, where mm -hmm. they feel safe to show you the ways they work things out, which is so important and so many of them are so nervous, especially the shy children, not necessarily mm. the weak children, mm. the shy children who might be in the top group are just too shy and too quiet to say in front of the whole class their way of working yeah. something out. Mm. But in their group, they feel confident enough to show you their understanding, their work. And in that moment of building a relationship, I feel you are able to truly question the children and allow for all those other children to benefit from mm. the questions you are asking. Not that children don't benefit from whole class questioning. I just feel um, you can go deeper yes. in a small group of children mm. because you can bring them all in. It's easier to work with a smaller group of children. For me, that is what is so amazing. Mm. About is it also teaching. possible that there could be more anxiety in a small group? I think there can be more anxiety in a small group, especially um, I found on teaching track, my strong group are very, very strong and they're all very... Um, most of them are very confident mm -hmm. learners, but then there's one or two that are not as confident who've moved, who I asked my teacher to move up into the, the stronger group from the middle group because I felt they were becoming so bored in the middle group. Mm -hmm. And you move them up and then moving from their comfort zone to a group who are so confident, yeah. they, they, be, they do, they become anxious. And you as a teacher need to then try bring them mm -hmm. out. And that's where that relationship that uh -huh. you've built is so mm -hmm. valuable to the learning for those children. And that is that for me is why it is so important to build this a relationship with every single learner in your classroom. Mm -hmm. Because I would imagine that with maths anxiety, a, a child might also feel I can hide in the bigger group, but I yes. cannot hide in, in the a smaller small group. group. Mm. And also depends on the teacher, I think. Yeah, her, definitely. Her attitude and, and, and how mm. she treats maths and how she mm -hmm. sees maths and the respect that she has for maths. And, uh, and, and um, the way in which she teaches when she teaches the maths, her, mm. her, her approach to teaching maths as well. So if she has an environment where you know, she creates this environment where maths is fun and that maths is not a problem. And she acknowledges her mistakes as well. And, 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 and she represents that to the learners, that it's okay. You know, we can make mistakes. It's fine. We're all here to learn from each other. I'm not mm. perfect. You're not perfect. If she creates an environment where they feel, you know, it's okay to make mistakes and we can talk to teacher and it's easy to ask teacher something because she listens. Mm. If you create that environment, I think um, you can minimize that anxiety. I learned about group teaching this time around. Uh -huh. It doesn't have to be perfect. You can take things away. There's a model that we use, but a model is just a model. Yes. Why not change things around? Why not incorporate different things and gradually add it? Scaffold a little bit. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you something, and I'm, I'm interested in this. When you think about reflecting, and, and one reflects in order to improve one's mm -hmm. practice. I mean, that, that's the whole mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you plan, you reflect um, and you think, you visualize how it's going to pan out and so on, um, or on your feet as, you, as the incident happens. In terms of falling back on the theory to give you answers when you reflect, where does it actually happen that you fall back on the theory? Is it more in your planning? Is it more while you are busy there on your feet is it in both how does it work for you i think it's both <laughs> i think it is both but i think um what i found interesting this teaching prac was 
the type of reflection um, that we had was a new um, layout and that layout sort of was in my mind all the time um, and it allowed me... You're referring to the critical incident. Yes, the critical incident layout and there's that section where it asks you to link it to theory. Honestly, I never thought about that mm -hmm. until this year, yeah. mm -hmm. to be honest with you. And bec I think we were stuck so rigidly to that old reflection sheet that we just aren't, we almost looked at the headings as questions and answered the questions. Mm -hmm. We didn't actually think any further of it. We didn't think about why the children were doing those things. Wh what, why actually were they doing those things? Not what we think. Why were they actually doing those things? There are theories out there that help you understand yeah. why yeah. whatever happened happened. Mm -hmm. And I think because of the layout of this new critical incident reflection, I had that in my mind all the time. As I was mm. teaching, I would think, oh my goodness, this is exactly what Vygotsky was trying to say. <laughs> you never was, thought about Vygotsky, you but never now we thought do about it. Before. <laughs> yeah. How many yeah. times we said to friends at Varsity, oh my word, it's such a waste of time. Seriously, we're never going to use these theories mm. again in our life. And you find yourself this mm. year for me, I was able to see, oh my goodness, it's exactly what he said. <laughs> he was a really clever man. <laughs> but <laughs> but also you realize what, that. What, what I think, because um, you say you've never thought of it, but I think that it has been in the back of your mind. Maybe you haven't got mm. like, oh, BF Skinner, behavior modification. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but you have thought like, wait, if I do this, it's going to cause the child to react that way. Yeah. So even though you haven't linked the actual complete theory, theory but it's yes. been at the back of your mind, mm. and, and that I think that... Um, Incidentally, and yeah. you know, played yeah. some role yeah. in. But you never, I, like, I'd never made the connection, if you know what I mean. Yeah. I'd never yeah. made the connection to uh, uh, if a child behaved in a certain way, you would come up with a solution, like, you'd reflect upon the behavior and come up with a solution. But you'd almost give yourself the credit for it, not anybody <laughs> else. <laughs> no, really. <laughs> but you almost would. You would give yourself the credit for this brilliant idea that you've come up with. But actually, if we hadn't done the theories that we have had done at mm. Varsity, we wouldn't have known um, how to necessarily deal with that mm. child in an appropriate way. You might have come up with ways, but they might not have been appropriate for the situation. But because of the theory, mm. you, we, now, I feel now I can make the connection. You know what I mean? The connection between the theory and mm -hmm. how you're going to actually um, deal with whatever situation is presented mm -hmm. to you. So you've got Vygotsky sure. sitting on this <laughs> shoulder, you've got Pierre <laughs> sitting there, you've got Brunner and a couple of others, <laughs> and you're asking, oh, what, would you do? <laughs> what would you do? Um, and then you take that and you say that in my class, mm. with my personality mm. and who I am, here and now with these children, this is how I adapt yeah. yes. it. Yes. And that's yeah. the beauty of it. That's mm -hmm. when the teacher yes. becomes artist. Not mm -hmm. underestimate the kids. Yeah, we, we really we, we should, should, should not really underestimate really them should. and what they are capable of doing. Yeah. And that was the first year we experienced that because all of the like in my first, second, and third year, um, the students, the children, will always come and say, "What must I teach you? What must I do now?" Like, mm -hmm. and this is the first year we all learned like, okay, how to manage the class where they are not doing that. Mm -hmm. But it goes back to what I think Tatum you said right at the beginning yeah. that. One of the umbrella concepts of teaching is that you want your kids to become gradually more yes, independent, independent of yes. you. And so that is something that in your planning, mm. I think one should mm. consider all the yeah. time that there's that kind of progression, that there are more challenges built in, but that the challenges are not only in terms of the content, but also in terms of the behavior yes. mm. and in, in terms of knowing that they must afterwards pick up the counters yes. and put it back in the bags yes. and go quietly back to their seats and whatever it is that they must do. But how wonderful mm. once you get to that stage mm. where you it's stand back and you want It's a good feeling, you feel proud, yeah. yeah.
bit of both. You had the whole class working together with you, and you said you think it was a perhaps elements of a behavioristic approach. What else could you do with this grade R class? How else could you approach it when you're teaching that particular activity? We did. We actually did an activity that I thought, like at, at the tables, where they had a egg carton. It was quite simple to make. At the bottom of the carton, we had number um, little stickers with a number on, mm -hmm. and then they had a bowl of counters that they had to place in, and. It would be it would be challenged because you had to would have to then um, work this out ahead of time. But those kind of activities you could do at the table, and it could use the children to help each other. Um, uh, even bring in a little bit of sabotaging, maybe, um, where the children could flash each other cards and then have to make that number or bring a num or give that one child gives another child amount of counters and mm. they have to find the card that fits with it. Those would all have fitted within what I want in my outcome. Yes. Um, now that we've watched it, I wonder if you can reframe this for us and see what the real challenges for you were here. It was a, a, a macro session. Um, we had started with a pan balance before that. So I was trying to teach the concept of equality and uh, what the equal sign means. And um, well, what was challenging for me was, or for the learners rather, for me, what I can see now is that they were given too much instructions from me and they hadn't managed the group well. And that I'd wasted so much time on um, instructions, giving them in more than one instruction and it was confusing to them. They were faster learners who were done and they were waiting for me. Um, I hadn't known what to do because um, not everybody was prepared or ready yet. Mm. So yeah, management I think. But I think you did give some very clear instructions. I tried to give in clear instructions but I think that I was uncertain mm. because I gave mm -hmm. one instruction and then afterwards I realized, oh, they were supposed to pack out all the counters and I gave another instruction. So I think um, I wasn't confident at that, that particular point in time, you know, what I wanted from them. I wasn't mm. confident and I think they picked it up and they were also uncertain about what I expected from them. Can I just say that I think, though, from um, an outsider watching, I think when it's us who we're watching, we always are more critical about what's mm. happening in the video. Yes. But for me, as an outsider watching it, I would have said that was a really good move. I would have said that was a really smart move as a teacher because the packets tend to become such a distraction for everybody um, during the teaching. So although it looks like you gave them so many instructions, it was to benefit them in the long run anyway. So it almost looks like for me that you reflected on the idea that they were it. going and then you change it, which is I good. Think. That's good. That's a good thing. Yes, mm -hmm. but I just feel that so much of teaching time was wasted. Mm -hmm. That's that's how I look. All the time. I like what you're saying because what it reminds me of is this whole constant tension, and I think Caps has made it worse, between what is and what should be. Mm. You know, you are you teaching in terms of what Caps is saying, what should be happening yeah. now, where the children should yes. be? In other words, are you teaching curriculum mm -hmm. or yeah. are you teaching children? children yeah. Yeah, and it's a tension that I think is uh, probably has m a, a much bigger impact on the psychology of, of a teacher today than we probably understand mm. or that we probably think. Mm. Because so many teachers, when you talk to them, they say, this is a constant tension with me. I, th there's this curriculum, do I stick to that? Or, you know, my children. So I like the fact that you're saying that you have something next to you, you make little notes on the different children's abilities, the, where they are at, and that as a teacher you can constantly then pick up from there when, when the opportunity is there. Yeah. I also